All right. Pray with me. God, help us. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that your words will come to life for us today in this room and on Zoom. God, give us ears to hear not just the words of men, but the words of God. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. And Lord, we give you our thanks in advance because we trust you to move among us in Christ's name. Amen. I want to remind you this morning that where you sit in this room, this room is full of the Word of God. Not because anyone stands here to preach it week after week, but if you just enter into this room and sit on any day at any time, this room is full of the words of God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are always with us in this room. On this wall between the windows, before the paint and the whatever that spray is, before the paint was put on the walls, people inscribed by hand the entire Gospel of Matthew on that western wall. On the back walls here at the north end of the room, the Gospel according to Mark was handwritten, all 16 chapters of it. Here on the east wall, between those windows, the Gospel of Luke, all 24 chapters were written by hand. And on this wall behind me, the Gospel according to John was inscribed by hand. And above you on the ceilings, the Lord's Prayer in multiple languages covers us every time we're in this room. This room is full of the Word of God, the Gospels about Jesus Christ and the prayer he taught us to pray. What an awesome thing it is, right? And over the years, many Holy Spirit-inspired words have been spoken in this place and about this place. Here are just a few. Jesse Tuyam saw our building supported at four corners by huge pillars of clear glass and guarded at each corner by huge angels with flashing light for wings. People were streaming through the doors, singing and praising God, she said, and they themselves were like lights, and the glory of God was strong in the house. Linda Paz heard the Lord say, I have given you gifts, a calling, press forward. And then she saw the roof of the building rise up, propelled by the people's praises and prayers. Faye Thompson saw a huge cloth spread above us in many shades of blue, waving endlessly as the wind of the Spirit moved through this place. Linda Pierce had a vivid dream while they were staying at Lake Tahoe. She recalls, I felt urgency to rush back to Trinity. God was going to do something. There was a guest speaker, and the Spirit of God was moving among the people. And at the altar call, a young boy ran past her crying as he went to the altar to receive prayer. The sanctuary was full. I saw people standing up all over the sanctuary and praying for one another. A lot of young people were praying with others. Pastor Paul Schock used to visit to preach every year or so, and he had a notable gift of prophecy. On his first visit to our church, he described a vision of our church with people crowded at the front doors waiting to come in for the service. On his last visit with us, he happened to recall that vision and affirmed he still saw the church full of worshipers speaking with one another about Jesus. Such visions and words linger. Their impact continues to unfold and to work in this place and the people who gather here. Our church was not born yesterday. 
the church was planted in evangelistic fervor more than 90 years ago. It was the seed of a revival in San Francisco. It's been tended by more than a dozen pastors through high seasons and low. And where we are today, how we fare during the last difficult 22 months, and who we're becoming is the fruit of nearly a century of prayer and spirit-filled devotion. Think about that. And what about them? Who prayed for our founder, Edith Erickson, to be saved? Who prayed for her as she attended Glad Tidings Bible Institute? And who prayed for her as she crossed the Golden Gate to plant a church in San Rafael? And what of those in whose heart God planted a vision for a church in the city called Glad Tidings? The pastors and people who carried on that great work for decades. I want you to have a sense that this didn't just start up yesterday or a few years ago. On and on, the river of life has flowed from the cross of Calvary outside the city of Jerusalem to this present moment in San Rafael, California, and beyond. We stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us, and our God is faithful. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And those who come after us will stand on our shoulders. Will they stand taller? Will their foundation be firmer? Will their exploits be greater? And will their fruit be more abundant? I hope so but only if we have done our part. Only if we have taken seriously Jesus' challenge to deny ourselves, take up our own cross, and follow him. Because if we live for ourselves, for the betterment of my life and improvement of my standing and the security of my future, then no, we will have failed to do our part. We will have failed to pass the baton. You see, we're all participants in a race. Many have thought of it as a competition, measuring our church against another, but it's not a competition. It's really a relay. When Jesus completed his leg of the race, it wasn't over, as his disciples feared, but when the Holy Spirit fell on them on the day of Pentecost, they realized that they had been handed the baton. Paul wrote to Timothy several words that I want to share with you today from the first letter, 6th chapter, 20th verse. Timothy, guard the good news which has been entrusted to you. You see, everything God gives us, everything God shows us, everything God reveals to us is a trust. He's entrusting that to you. It's not just so that you can say, wow, I saw that. You know, great sunrise. Man, did you see that sunrise? No, it's not that. It's an entrustment to you. It's something for you to hold, to guard, to use, to multiply. He wrote in the second letter, Second chapter, second verse, you've heard my message, and it's been confirmed by many witnesses. And trust this message to faithful individuals who will be competent to teach others. We've been entrusted with the world's greatest message, and we have a responsibility to pass it on to someone else. And in the second letter, chapter 1, Paul said, with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, protect the good news that has been entrusted to you. We have a responsibility to protect what we've received. To make sure that the next generation gets it in good form. Gets it in sound 
words. The race didn't end with Edith Erickson. Others came after her. And many have gone out from this gospel center to plant churches and missions and businesses and families literally around the world. And when I finish my leg of the race, or you finish your leg of the race, the race will very likely continue after us. So, with that in mind, how are we running this race? Are we thinking about those who will come after us? To whom will you pass your baton? To whom will you give what the Lord has given to you? Are you investing in your teammates? Are you raising up others to follow after? May the Lord help us to be faithful, to hold on to sound doctrine, not compromising the gospel message through our speech, through our behavior, or through our teaching. May we pass the baton of faith to the next generation without altering or diluting his word from which our faith springs. Current social culture may never again support the message that we have to share. It certainly doesn't look like it's going in that direction because we are a part of a remnant foretold by the scriptures and the gospel must be passed from hand to hand. One-to-one -one is a personal gift. People must know, and you and I must tell them. Would you be contented to live your entire life without leading even one person to faith in Jesus? If so, I think you're aiming too low. I realize that the Lord has to draw each one to himself. I'm not in charge of that. I can't make people trust in Christ. But who's going to pray for that engagement? Who's going to say, Lord, draw them. Draw them, Lord. Don't let them wander off the cliff. And when he draws them, what then? Who will tell them what Jesus has done for them and what they should do in response? Will it be you? truly hope so. Somewhere along the line, actually at many points along the line, people need to step up and bear witness of the mercy and the faithfulness of Christ, of the truthfulness of the scriptures, and of the reality of the life of faith. People need to know. Your mission, friend, should you choose to accept it, is to tell as many people as you can about Jesus Christ. You see, if we're a startup company, our mission can be whatever we want it to be. But if we're a church, we don't choose our own mission. Our mission is set by the one who's called us to himself and placed us together in this local assembly. It's based on the saving grace given by the Lord Jesus Christ and his commandments. There's the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment, which Jesus said is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. And just who is my neighbor, people ask. So Jesus clarified that point for us. His first command said, love your fellow believer as I have loved you. That's your first and closest neighbor. And then he also said, love your enemies and pray for them. That's your most distant, probably, neighbor. The great commandment, the second commandment, and the great commission. As you go, he said, make disciples from among all peoples. Love the Lord. Love your neighbor, make disciples. That is our mission. It's never been different 
it will never be, God willing, different. That is our mission. Nothing less and nothing more. This is what we do. This is what defines you as a Christian. And this is what we do together. This is what defines us as a church. Love the Lord. Love your neighbor. Make disciples. We love the Lord by studying his word together, by praying together, by worshiping together, by serving our community together. Loving the Lord. We love one another by praying for each other, by keeping short accounts, which means making apologies and granting forgiveness as often as needed, and by helping each other in practical ways, like when you guys help Dan move his furniture. We make disciples by engaging outsiders, by meeting needs, by sharing Jesus. We can do this. We can do this if we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Only then will the gospel be taken to the ends of the earth. This is what Jesus said. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and then you will be my witnesses to testify about me to the ends of the earth. That's what enables the church to pray, to give to send, and to go to the very ends of the earth with the message of Christ's redeeming love. It's the power of the Holy Spirit operating in us and among us. Our assignment is global. It's not just local. It's inclusive of every nation and every people group. You're part of the ends of the earth, no question about that, especially if we start at Jerusalem. We're just about the end of the earth here. Reaching the world starts with you, your relationships and your personal sphere of influence, the people you know, the people God has put into your life or into whose lives God has put you. That's where it all begins. Yes, charity begins at home. But if it stops there, it's selfish, not selfless. There are people in today's world who have never once heard the name of Jesus, not even as a swear word. There are people in our world who have never read from the pages of a Bible, let alone seen one. There are cities, not just villages, cities that do not have a single church meeting within their borders. We're not done yet. The mission is not completed. How can we rise to the challenge? The Holy Spirit has been given to us to enable us. This is a global challenge. You think the pandemic was a global challenge? This one has lasted 2,000 years, and we're still working it out. Listen, my friends, you have been called. You've been called to Jesus to be with him, and you have been called to go in his name. But you must also be empowered. You have to be empowered. You must wait for the promise of the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is not just an experience to be logged in your spiritual journal. It's an endowment with holy power to know the Lord, to feel his presence and hear his voice, to love as he loves those that you naturally care about and those to whom you're naturally indifferent. And it's the power to extend his kingdom, to impart his reigning influence in your world, in our world. Our mission is made possible by the Holy Spirit. So rejoice because each one of you is part of God's plan to reach the planet with the gospel. Hallelujah. I considered a number of possible themes for this year to prod and guide our development as a church, but the Spirit led me to repeat the theme from last year, saying, 
We weren't done with it yet. Confronted by the varying circumstances of a worldwide pandemic, we did manage to see release in various ways. The release of engagement with the Bible. Some of you have read through the entire Bible in this last year. The release of new connections within the church. We've met some new people from the local neighborhood and far beyond who have joined us via Zoom, at least. The release of new connections within the church and the release from the gripping fear of a disease, release from the imagined confinement of safety restrictions, release from indifference toward fellow church members, even though we weren't in their physical presence very often, release from financial constraints to keep generosity alive, and a continuing release of the Spirit in ministry to other people. So what remains to be done? Well, I continue to ask the Lord to clarify this for me, but this is what I know so far. A greater release of the Spirit in prayer, in worship, in missional fervor, and miraculous favor. Don't we need all those? That's what we're engaging in. That's what we're starting tomorrow morning as we enter into 21 days of prayer and fasting. I think also a greater release of generosity that's not defined by what we have and of caring service that's not defined by what's convenient. I think also of a greater release of bold and creative witness in our community that isn't limited in our minds by personality types, but rather expressive of them. And what I mean by that is whether you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert or whatever personality type label you want to give yourself, there is a place for you in the ministry of the gospel. It's not just for people who can stand up and sing with a solo voice. It's not just for people who can talk endlessly, hopefully about important topics. It's not just for people who are comfortable to meet strangers and talk to them about such important things as the eternal destiny of their soul. It's for everybody. And so I'm praying for that. I'm praying for a greater release of bold and creative witness, and a greater release of hunger and thirst for the kind of righteousness that only Jesus can give, because if we're bold to witness but nobody wants to hear, we're just going to be running into brick walls. So I'm praying that God will stir the hunger. As I said before, he has to draw them. Lord, draw them. Whatever it takes, whatever you need to use, Draw them, break them out of self-satisfaction and cause them to know that life is about more than getting by from week to week. And one last thing I'm aware of is a greater pragmatic unity of the churches in Marin in worship and witness. I believe that there is so much more that we can do together. But for a whole host of reasons, we're timid about that. And my prayer is that God will erase that. He said, I haven't given you a spirit of timidity, but of love and power and a sound mind. And I'm praying that the churches in Marin and the pastors of those churches will experience that transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And that we will see a greater unity of his church throughout our county. What a year this is going to be. 2022. You don't need to say, bring it on. It's here already. Just keep rolling. Don't wake up every day to ask, what will COVID do today? Don't even ask, what will the Lord do in me today? Instead, rise up in faith to ask, what will the Holy Spirit do today through me? Lord, what do you want to do with my life? Where will you take me? Who will I see? Who will I meet today? 
What encounters, what opportunities will I have? Prepare me for them, Lord. Let me be ready to meet them with faith in the name of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because if he does it through you, he'll already be doing it in you. Isn't that right? Father, we are so grateful for your unfailing love for us. Thankful that in the name of Jesus Christ, we have all that we need to do all that you ask of us. Lord, sometimes what we think we need is not what we really need. And sometimes what we really need is not what we can see or feel. So we choose to put our trust in you to put our trust in your promise, to put our trust in the spirit whom you've given us, and to believe, God, that you can work through us beyond what we could ask or imagine. Let your power work in us today and throughout this year. God, I pray that Trinity Community Church will see these releases through the spirit among us. God, I pray that when we come to December 31st, 2022, we'll look back and say, he did it, and he did more than we even imagined he would do. God, we're not dependent on what we can offer. We're trusting you for what you give, for what you can do. And we're just thanking you that you call us to be a part of that. So God, we thank you for what's past, even the difficult things, because you make all things contribute to the good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So we thank you for what's behind us, and we thank you for what's ahead, because we believe you're leading us into it. May the future be a glow with the glory of God, Lord, we pray that we will hear angels singing, that we will see the Spirit's hand moving, that hearts will hunger and thirst to know Jesus Christ, and your people will be bold to witness because their hearts are knitted together in the love and unity of Jesus. God, would you let each one of us, each and every one of us, play our small part in the great things you're doing. May we grow as the church grows deeper in the love of Jesus, fuller with the power of your spirit. God, take us into this new year with great hope and anticipation. And we pray, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. The will of the Lord be done. In Jesus' name.